Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, and today I have the immense, the immense pleasure of being here with Dr. Robert Plomin. He is Professor of Behavioral Genetics at the Social Genetic and Developmental Psychiatry Center at King's College London and Research Professor at the Medical Research Council. He is one of the leading figures in the entire field of behavioral genetics and is also the author of many books including Behavioral Genetics, A Primer, Separate Lives, Why Siblings Are So Different, Nature and Nurture, An Introduction to Human Behavioral Genetics, Nature and Nurture During Infancy and Early Childhood, G is for Genes, and the most recent one, Blueprint, How DNA Makes Us Who We Are. So, Dr. Plomin, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. It's really a pleasure to have you on. Well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me, Ricardo. I look forward to it. Okay, good. Okay, so uh, since I'm talking with you, I would really like to first ask you a, a general question about the field of behavioral genetics. So, um, would you like perhaps to tell us a little bit about uh, uh, its history? Because, I mean, wh when I hear about behavioral genetics, people usually mm -hmm. go all the way back to Sir Francis Galton and people like that. So could you tell us just a little bit about that? Yeah, well, the history can go much farther back, right? Animal breeding has gone on for thousands of years. So there's that long history. The modern history, most people date as, um, say 1960 with this book by Fuller and Scott called Behavior Genetics. That was mostly about animal research. But you know, Francis Galton does deserve credit for thinking about individual differences and the extent to which his cousin Darwin's ideas about inheritance might be relevant, not to species averages, but rather to uh, individual differences within a species. Um, but, um, I, you know, the first he proposed really twin and adoption designs in a way, and those first studies were done in the early 20s. And there were a number of studies into the 30s and the 40s, twin and adoption. In the 50s, there were quite a few animal studies comparing inbred strains of mice and selection studies of mice that were very powerful demonstrations of genetic influence because they're actually experimental approaches, you know, where you can select artificially for characteristics. And that's kind of the proof that genetics is important from my point of view. It gets rid of all the other complexities about it because that's what inheritance is about. But then it was um, um, in the 60s and 70s, there was a real backlash against this just early buds of behavioral genetics. And partly that was due to uh, Jensen and Kernstein and, and books that um, were probably, well, they just upset people and made people notice, I think, that there's this insurgence of genetics. And they thought it had been wiped out by the, by the 19 uh, eugenics and, and Nazi Germany. And, um, but that's about when I came on the scene, say, in, in 1970, I was in graduate school. And people need to be reminded of how much things have changed. Because in the 1970s, in the textbooks we had in psychology, genetics wasn't mentioned. The only mention you might get are like uh, relatively rare single gene or chromosomal anomalies, you know, like Down syndrome. But that's just sort of mentioned on the side. Everything was thought to be environmental. You know, we actually learned that schizophrenia was caused by what your mother does to you in the first few years of life. Environmentalism was so dominant that it was dangerous sometimes, well, professionally for sure, and sometimes even personally to talk about genetics. People were just so convinced environment was good, genetics is bad. And so that was in the early 1970s. And in these 40 years, there's been an amazing change in how people perceive genetics, how much they're afraid of it, how much they know about it. And in part, that's because of the data we collected on twin and adoption and family studies over four decades. But what really made a difference, I think, was the DNA revolution because then it became much more real because you're talking about specific bits of DNA sequence. So this, is what, this was sort of the context in which I decided to write this book, Blueprint, 
And I, I was actually asked by a publisher to write it 30 years ago. But I realized then that um, it, the timing wasn't really right. There was a lot more data that needed to be collected. No one then had really thought of the DNA revolution. It wasn't even the idea of sequencing the genome. You know, no one really thought that was within, the, within our lifetime. So I'm glad I waited because there's so much data now that's piled up. I don't see how any serious scientist can deny genetic influence on individual differences, even in behavior. But, but the um, real difference is that the DNA revolution has come along. And I think the idea of not just talking abstractly about genetic components of variants, but talking about your DNA predicting your risk for alcoholism or schizophrenia, that's what's going to change everything in my, in my perspective. So when the book was published in October, that was just three months ago, I was really very nervous about what kind of response I'd get. And I've been blown away. I mean, I, I had nightmares. I mean, friends of mine were telling me it's like this professional suicide note, you know, that um, you could be pilloried and, you know, really set up as a pariah for talking about genetics as the main systematic influence in what makes us who we are as individuals. And, and in this book, unlike a lot of my other work, I didn't pull punches. You know what I mean? I didn't hold back. I was just going to say what I think the data says and then talk about implications, possible implications, but not worried so much about, you know, always trying to mollify people who are against genetics. I thought I was just going to come out and say it. Genetics is the major systematic influence making us who we are as individuals. And so the response has been amazingly positive from my point of view. Um, you know, there's been a couple bad reviews, like one really weird one in Nature that we'll probably talk about. But it's been reviewed in all the major newspapers in the United, in, in the United Kingdom. And it was just published a few weeks ago in the States. And it's been Wall Street Journal. And it's going to be New York Times. So it's getting quite a bit of publicity. And the response has been um, really more positive than my wildest dreams, even academically, but in terms of the media, but especially in terms of people. You know, I've given a dozen talks at festivals and scientific, you know, um, I mean, for the public, events for the public, which seems to be, I'm very pleased to see, um, a real resurgence of interest in scientific events that people from the public go to and pay a lot of money to go to. I love it. And so in signing, I've signed, signed hundreds of copies of the book. I've met a lot of the public and I haven't had any hostility. Whereas when I was in graduate school, it, there were several times I was called a Nazi, you know, and it was really scary, you know, um, people, how angry they were at the thought of genetic influence. And now the main comment I get from the public that I absolutely love is that they're, they're not against genetics. They just didn't know much about it. And they think it's perfectly reasonable. In fact, very often I've had like half a dozen people say, why is there so much controversy about this? It just seems so blindingly obvious that some of the differences, even between infants in early life, it, they're not something we just did to them as parents. You know, kids are different from birth. And so uh, I'm just kind of enjoying it now because it's quite a relief for me that I'm not, you know, just being attacked, you know, for this, that people are actually very excited about it. So. So that's kind of a mixing my history with the history of behavioral genetics. But I think it's a, you know, you could talk about this for days probably. But um, I think that's probably more as much history as most people would want to know probably. Yes, yes. But all of you, all of what you just said is very interesting. And I would like to pick up on one of the points you referred to, because I mean, uh, would it be correct to say that throughout most of psychology's history, environmentalism really dominated. Because, I mean, we had uh, some very influential figures like Freud, like B.F. Skinner and behaviorism. And then perhaps, since you refer to, uh, let's say, the advent of modern behavioral genetics in the 60s, 70s, 
perhaps that was really a very complicated time for it to arise because uh, it was precisely when we were going through the um, uh, cultural and social revolutions and, and I mean uh, p people didn't really like the idea of us having some sort of innateness to our psychology, right? Mm -hmm. No, I really agree with all of that. And again, that could be another day's discussion, probably, all of those issues. But uh, was there something specific there you wanted to ask me about? Because I agree with everything you just said. Uh, well, I, I mean, perhaps if you could just comment uh, on what you think were the influence, uh, was the influence of uh, environmental ideas in the history of psychology, because also apart from that, just it just came to my mind that also uh, fields like uh, social psychology, unfortunately, uh, have been influenced also a lot by these ideas and I've even recently had on the show uh, people like Dr. Lee Jessim who has been reviewing a lot of the literature over that has been going over the last few decades in social psychology and I mean uh, people tend to interpret the results uh, through their own uh, personal ideology, let's say, and then it also very easily gets into politics and things like that that are very, really complicated for, mm -hmm. for people, right? Well, yeah. Well, at a, I think at a fundamental level, it isn't just necessarily ideology. The, the reason environmentalism seems so um, acceptable is you can see it. You know, parents do things and, and there are certain outcomes for their kids. And to assume that these correlations are causal, you know, that the parents have environmentally made their kid to be the way they are, it just seems so, you know, if you don't think about it, it's perfectly reasonable. Schizophrenics have schizophrenic parents. No problem from an environmental perspective. You know, of course they do. You know, if, if your parents are psychotic, of course the kids are going to be psychotic environmentally. So the thing about environment is it's always reasonable Whereas you don't see genetics in the same way. And so that's one reason why it's just easier for people to believe environmental influences. But the other ones, you know, the political ones are also there, certainly. You know, that um, it, it, the idea that, um, you know, some people would say the American Revolution is based on the idea that anyone can become president. And with the current president, maybe that seems to be true. <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, uh, yeah, it just sort of don't get me going on this because it's, it's, there's so much to say about that. Um, I don't know. In some ways, I like focusing on the science of it because in the end, you know, I decided um, when I was called a Nazi and people were very upset about even talking about genetic influence in psychology in the 70s and 80s. Um, I decided I wouldn't respond to criticisms like that because I found when you try to do it, the people who are making those criticisms, they're not doing science. It, it's like they don't have anything better to do. You know, and if you honestly address an issue like the equal assumptions, uh, equal um, environments assumption of the twin method, you know, and you say there's a lot of data here and you go through it, it doesn't make any difference. They'll just say, yeah, but, but what about this? You know, and so you could spend your whole life doing that. And I decided if psychology is a science, eventually, empirical data will win out. And I think that's what's happened over these 40 years. The, the mountain of evidence is such that I, I just don't see how a serious scientist can deny genetic influence on almost all psychological traits. So um, if there was something more specific you wanted to ask me about that, Ricardo, feel, feel free, you know, during the entire interview. But these are really big issues and, I, you know, um, unless we spend days on this interview, we're not going to get through much of it. Mm -hmm. Yes, right. So, uh, yes, but just before we get more specifically into the studies done in behavioral genetics, just one more question, because I've been thinking about this for a while and I would like to know your opinion. So uh, I think that on the one hand, uh, perhaps people also take into account 
uh, what is innate about human beings because I mean I've been talking with a lot of evolutionary psychologists for example and uh, one of the aspects related to theory of mind is that people really think about other people as if they have an essence that is something that is separated from the environment let's say and so they they would have uh, innate traits let's put it that way but on the other hand it's also true that genetics is something that we don't really have direct access to and apart from that it's also a very complicated discipline because we have to really learn a lot and then we also have things like for example nowadays proteomics uh, the, the, that is uh, and also interactomics the way uh, proteins that, that are the products of genes interact with each other so i, I mean uh, there's i think that there's these two factors that on the one hand people have some innate intuitions about uh, innateness but on the other hand it's also very difficult for people to understand how genetics work so yeah what well again you're, like you're raising many topics there and i think the one though that is is an important one to address is the idea of what i call normative versus individual differences approaches and there's different levels of analysis so a lot of psychology is about universals you know, in development, why do some children, why do children learn to say words at 12 and two word sentences at 18 on average? They're, they're normative in the sense that this is on average, the human species does this. And evolutionary psychologists are very interested in why does the human species do X and other species, primates, don't or, you know, whatever. So they're about averages. And that's important. Darwin was in a way talking about evolution in that sense. But what, what my view of genetics is at a very different level of analysis, and that's individual differences. So we've got to be clear that innateness and evolutionary adaptations, we're talking about this either universal or at least normative average level. And that's fine. These are different perspectives. They're not right or wrong. They're just more or less useful. But the key point is they're different levels of analysis. And one doesn't necessarily tell you about another. That is, something like language could be, and most people would say, evolutionarily constrained. I mean, you know, that man's a natural language user. It's not my area, but, you know, I think most people would think that that's a genetic phenomenon, that we've evolved somehow to uh, 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 lock in genetic variants that make it easier for us to learn language. That's at that universal level, though. And... If that's true, that doesn't mean that individual differences in how children learn to speak, how fluent they are, um, that doesn't mean that's genetic. Because it, it, a really critical point to get by a lot of these difficult issues of group differences, ethnic differences, uh, sex differences, is to realize that the causes of average differences between groups are not necessarily related to the causes of individual differences. So I know that's not exactly what you were asking about, but it is so important to realize that we're just talking about the 1% of DNA that differs between us. The 99% that's the same for all of us is what makes us human. It's tremendously important to try and understand that. However, Understanding individual differences is very important. These are questions about why are some people schizophrenic and others not? Why are some alcoholic or why are some kids reading disabled? So individual differences are, you could argue, socially, you know, the important question. But a lot of psychology is not addressing individual differences. And so uh, I'm a big fan of studying individual differences rather than group differences because I think the methods we have are very much more powerful to understand the causes of individual differences. And we don't have as definitive tools to address questions of average differences, even average differences between sexes, between males and females. It's very hard to pin that down. So again, something I could go on and on about, but um, I, I think uh, if you want to follow up though, please feel free. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay, so now, Let's talk a little bit about the types of studies that you do in behavioral genetics. So let, let's start with perhaps 
one, one type of study that has been one of the gold standard studies, at least throughout most of behavioral genetics, I think that is the, sti the studies done with uh, identical and fraternal twins reared apart. So, so uh, why is it so important that uh, the twins are reared apart? And w what are perhaps other ways by which you control uh, environmental factors in these types of studies? Well, studies of identical twins reared apart are actually quite rare because, as you can imagine, not many identical twins are reared apart early in life. But they're very dramatic. You know, so there's a film that came out in the States earlier this summer called Three Identical Strangers. Have you run into that? Um, uh, I, I think I did, yes. Yeah. Well, it's, be, it's being released now in the UK, and I think it'll be in Europe um, soon. And it's really worth seeing because these are three identical twins who... Um, it's bad for science. I don't like advocating the film because there's a very bad science side of this, an ethical side. But what you see at first is this guy goes to the university for the first day in upstate New York. He grew up in Brooklyn and he meets and everyone's calling him Eddie, but his name's Dave. He's, he's just first day on campus. He doesn't know anybody. But then he meets this guy, Eddie, and it's like looking in the mirror. These two guys are just so identical. And then not just in how they look, but in their personality, they're very outgoing, big smiles, you know, very vivacious sort of guys. And then um, also in psychopathology, they all had depressive symptoms. So they quickly started um, exploring what this was. They realized they were adopted. They were adopted from the same adoption agency in New York. One was raised in an upper class family, one in a lower class family. Well, this created huge publicity in the 80s. And as a result, though, this amazing thing happened, a third identical triplet in this case surfaced and again they're, they're very hard to tell apart they're so physically similar and they're just similar in so many ways the bat so it's a dramatic illustration of how clones reared in different environments are amazingly similar and these were the bad story the bad part of the story is they were intentionally separated by the psychiatrist who said wouldn't it be a cool experience experiment. Let's put one in an upper class family, one in a middle class family, one in a lower class family, and not tell the parents that these are identical triplets. So they were studying these kids throughout early development, doing Super 8 films, which were developed back then, and never telling the parents that there are these identical triplets. So it's incredibly unethical. So that's the part of the film, you know, that bothers me. Uh, you know, it's not good for science. It's the mad scientist sort of thing again. But the first part of the film is a very dramatic illustration of how similar people are, clones are, if even though reared in different environments. And so that's kind of the bottom line of what I'm trying to say is it's not just that genetics is important. The environment's important, but it's not the environment that environmentalists always assumed was important which is nurture, the idea that there are these systematic influences primarily due to the family. Schizophrenia runs in families because of nurture. It's the way the parents treat the kids. But the environment's important because heritability is generally about 50%, meaning of the differences between people in traits like personality, uh, DNA, inherited DNA differences from that cell with which we began life and now it's the same DNA in all our trillions of cells, those DNA differences are making these differences that we call heritability. So it's big, 40, 50% of the differences, but it's not 100%. The rest of it is environment. It's not in the sense that it's not inherited DNA differences, which is means anything else, which could be accidents, illnesses, biological causes, mutations that are not inherited, like Cancers, skin cancers, are, 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 are not very heritable, but they primarily involve DNA mutations. But you don't pass them on to your offspring and you didn't inherit them from your parents. So the tricky part of this message in Blueprint, that's why I say DNA is the major systematic influence making us who we are as individuals. The environment's important, but it's not that systematic environment. It's essentially random. And that's what people have real trouble trying to accept. These are real environmental influences 
but they're not the systematic influences shared by people growing up in the same family. And so that's why I think this film is important because the bottom line of what I'm trying to say is that if you had been adopted at birth and reared in a different environment, had different family, parents, went to a different school, got in a different job, you would still be remarkably similar to who you are now. In fact, you'd be as similar as identical twins reared apart because you are, in fact, your clone, right? I mean, this clone of yours who's reared in this different environment is your identical twin. So we could actually, so that wouldn't mean you're identical because, you know, identical twins aren't identical for traits, but they're very, very similar. They're very noticeably similar. So I think that's why identical twins reared apart are so important, you know, as a dramatic illustration, but they're rare. And so that's why the vast majority of studies don't involve do not involve twins reared apart. They involve identical and non-identical twins reared together because you'd still have to predict that if genetics is important, identical twins who are clones of one another, they're genetically identical, they have to be more similar for a trait if the trait is influenced by, hair, by genetics than are these non-identical fraternal dizygotic twins. So that's why the twin method is so valuable. And 1% of all births are twins. So there's a lot of twins out there. Mm -hmm. So that's the twin method. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so would it be a fair assessment to say that perhaps two of, two of the main things that people have to take into account here is that when there's offspring, when there's parent offspring resemblance, uh, perhaps Part of it is also because parents and their children share genes and also on the other hand that even though we are influenced by, by our environment, uh, those influences are genetically mediated. W would that be correct? Yes. Yeah, it, no, exactly right. That is the point. And as we were saying before, environmentalism would make it easy for you to say, to answer the question, why are parents and their children similar in weight, for example? And, you know, they correlate maybe 0.3 for weight. Uh, I assume your listeners know what a correlation is from zero to one. And so they correlate 0.3. Environmentalists said, right, of course, you know, the parents pr provide the food for the kid. They give them, they give them role models for uh, diet and for activity and that sort of thing. But the other major method, well, first of all, twin method would show identical twins are much more similar than fraternal twins, about twice as similar. Not Identical twins are not identical. They correlate maybe 0 0.6, not 1, 0 0.6, but they're twice as similar as non-identical twins. But the real killer design, I think, is the adoption design, which is like a, if, uh, a social experiment. If the twin method is a biological experiment, that is, one-third of all twins are identical twins and two-thirds are non-identical twins. That's biological. It's, it's not a real experiment. You haven't randomly assigned zygotes to identical and non-identical status. But, it, you know, it's pretty good as these experiments go because they're both raised in the same womb. Half of uh, fraternal twins are same-sex, so it's a little better experiment if you compare same-sex fraternal twins to identical twins because they're always identical in sex because they're genetically identical, right? So, um, yeah, there, uh, I forget where I was going with that, but I wanted to just say the twin method's important, but the adoption method is great because it, it's a completely different method. It has different assumptions, and yet the results converge on the conclusion from twin studies. And so with the body weight thing, I think it's really remarkable. There's been dozens of studies, including adoption studies, and what the adoption study shows is, yes, you know, kids and their parents correlate about 0.3 for weight. But the, the adoption method says, let's look at environmental parents, adoptive parents of kids who raise the kids from the first year of life. They correlate zero for weight. So, you know, it, it, it can't be a trans, it, that transmission, the similarity between parents and offspring for weight can't be due to this na nurture because here, these parents are nurturing the kids, giving them their food, giving them their lifestyle, and yet there's a zero correlation. The other side of it then is, how about adopted kids and their birth parents, whom they never saw after the first few days of life? They correlate just the same, 0.3, as do parents who rear their kids. 
So if you put this together, it's another way of saying the same thing I said before. Genetics is very important, but the environment is also important. But whatever the environment is, it's not these systematic influences suggested by the word nurture. So it, they, I, I do want to emphasize they are environmental influences. They're not inherited DNA differences. But the amazing thing is how different they are from the way environmentalists thought the environment works. If you think of obesity and body weight, for example, there's all the theories are these environmentalistic theories. And as I said before, they always make sense post hoc. You know, after the fact, you can, yeah, sure, that sounds reasonable. Parents give the kids food and lifestyle and all of that. But, um, they're, but they're wrong. And I think that's an exciting part of this message, which um, is, is not, you know, it, it's what comes out of looking at all the data together. And so that's why I feel so good about writing the book now, because Blueprint, because it's a great time for pulling those data together. Because in a way, you can say we don't need more twin and adoption studies, because now you can do genetic studies, you can estimate genetic influence with DNA alone. You don't need special samples like twins and adoptees. What's more is any researcher can include DNA in their studies, not to find genes, but to use genes that other people have found, these polygenic scores that involve putting together thousands of DNA differences to predict genetic promise and problems for psychological traits. And that can be included in any study at a, a relatively little money compared to what we normally spend in psychological studies. So that's what makes it such an exciting moment in the history of psychology. Because I know in these reviews, some people accuse me of you know being over the top on this, but I think I'm going to look back in a decade, and this is going to be a moment, a real tipping point in psychology. Because you can see it happening already. Research is being really changed. People, big studies, they're all incorporating DNA into their studies now. And I think it's going to transform clinical psychology for reasons I talk about in the book. And I also think it'll help us in our self-understanding. So that's something I go into the book. I present the first profile of polygenic scores for psychological traits for me, just to explain, you know, people worry about the sky's going to fall if we knew our genetic risk for things. And I don't see it at all. I think people want to understand themselves. They take psychological tests are very popular on the web because people want to know about themselves. But DNA tells you something about yourself that nothing else can. And so I just think it's tremendously exciting. And um, it bothers me that uh, some people don't want to just say, great, you know, isn't that exciting? Let's, you know, we can do new things. And we're not just turning the same crank in psychology that some fields turn for decades. So, and, so anyway, uh, I'm, not, I'm not embarrassed about being um, a cheerleader for this stuff. Because I don't know why doom mongers, you know, people are always saying, oh, there's all these worries and, you know, this is all terrible. Man, I don't understand why people aren't, you know, just happy to have new toys to play with. <laughs> I think it's just so exciting, really. Right. And still about the environment, isn't it also the case that it is really very difficult to control for confounding factors coming from the environment? Because... I mean, it's also the case that it is extremely difficult to account for the effects like things like accidents and unique events have in our lives. Yeah, Correct. exactly right. That, um, my colleague, John DeFries, with whom I did all my early work in the 70s and 80s at the University of Colorado at Boulder, he said from the start, when we first started realizing, John Lowland, who's a famous behavioral geneticist, um, wrote this book in 1976 called The Heredity of, uh, Heredity of Personality. And in that, he first pointed out that this finding about it's not nurture. Environment's important, but whatever it is, it's this non-shared environment. It's not making two kids in the same family any more similar than kids in different families. Well. I said, well, shouldn't we be trying to find out what these influences are? Because all the previous studies only study one child per family. So they can't ask, what are the environmental factors that make kids growing up in the same family different from one another? 
And identical twins are, are particularly good tools for this because genetics doesn't make them different because they're identical genetically. The only thing that makes them different are these non-shared environmental influences. So I thought it was really a, a great way to go. But John DeFries said back then, he says, it's just idiosyncratic chance, stochastic, random effects. You know, genetics can't program things. It just kind of nudges you in directions. And that's as it should be, because you want this environmental flexibility. You don't want these genetic influences to be programmed and deterministic and hardwired, because that makes you inflexible as well. But for 30 years then, I and lots of other people tried to find out what these influences are. And as you say, uh, it's very hard to pin them down, because what's an accident? You know, um, and even an illness, it, or a famous example for me is Bill Clinton, you know, the president of the United States said, um, he became interested in politics because at the age of 16, he shook John F. Kennedy's hand. And people do talk about that, looking back on their lives, these significant moments that are turning points in their life. Now, you never know how much that is just retrospective, telling a story about your life. I think, as you're suggesting, a lot of it is kind of random chance events. Now, the the, the other part of this that's really fascinating to me is, as you alluded to before, a, a lot of what looks like systematic environmental effects are actually mediated genetically. And so parents, you get, and you just, it's correlations don't imply causation. So correlations between parent behavior and kids' outcomes. You can't assume that's environmentally causal from parent to child. Increasingly, I'm, I'm convinced that parents are mostly responding to genetic differences in their kids. I have one grandson, you know, who I always thought what grandparents are supposed to do. I have six grandchildren. I thought you used to sit on a, a sofa with them. You read to them and, you know, you improve their mind or something. This, this guy won't even, won't have it. I mean, he, he just always want to go and he wants the rough house play. And it would almost be abusive if I made him sit there and you, I'm going to read to you and, you know, you know, you respond to the kids' differences. Um, so, but more than that, I think what we haven't even touched in psychology is what I think the ultimate impact of this, we call it GE correlation, gene environment correlation, is that, it, you know, DNA doesn't do anything by itself. It has to have an environment to do something in, an evolutionarily expected environment. You know, you need oxygen, you need food. So these people will say, how can height be heritable? Because if you lock a kid in the closet and don't feed them, they're going to be stunted in growth. Well, that they're just missing the point. We're talking about the normal range of variation and individual differences in DNA and environments that exist in this normal range. Um, and um, sorry, I got off on I got off track on that. Um, so where were we going with that? Where were we starting with that? I, uh, well, oh, yes, about, about, the, um, about the correlations, gene That's environment right, yeah. correlations, yeah. right? Yeah. So more important, I think, than just parents and teachers reacting to differences in their kids is the idea of what I call active GE correlation. That is, you know, the most highly heritable cognitive test is vocabulary. And people say, how can that be? But they're thinking DNA somehow puts vocabulary words in our heads. Well, it obviously doesn't but it makes some kids more attuned to language. I have another grandchild who is always asking, you know, you say some word and they want to know about the nuances of words. Well, but why did you use that word rather than this word? And that, that other grandson I mentioned, you know, he would say, whatever, you know, you know what I mean. It doesn't matter what, you know, you get the idea. And so I think that's an important a fundamental shift in the way we think about the environment. From learning theory, we thought of the environment, and most psychologists still do think of the environment as something out there that happens to us. You know, we're kind of passive recipients, like a rat in a cage who the experimenter either shocks or doesn't shock. But that's not the way the environment works. The environment works, um, we create our own environments and we select them and we modify them in a way that's correlated with our genetic tendencies. So that's this nature of nurture topic which is a chapter in my book that I think is so important to um, 
realize that what looks like, when you get correlations between environment and behavioral outcomes, you can't assume that it's caused in the direction from environment to behavior. More and more, I think it's the other way around, that our genetic it's another long story. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and I mean, once I learned about gene environment correlations, it really changed the way I look at people's behavior and human psychology. Because I mean, when I look back at the time when I was a child, I really remember now that I actively looked for uh, books to read and I went through my mother's collection of cassettes to, to, to watch uh, movies from uh, ancient Rome and things like that because I mean of, of course I, I was stimulated also by my parents to do so but they didn't really put me in a place and tell me and told me oh now we are going to watch this movie or something like that it was really I who choose mm -hmm. the types of movies that I watched and the time I spent reading and all of those things so I, I think that's really a very powerful thing to take into account I really agree my story is even maybe more dramatic because my family, no one went to university. We had no books in our house when I grew up. Just a tiny flat, a one bedroom flat with me, my sister and my parents in an inner city Chicago. And because they grew up in the depression, they didn't go to school. Um, it certainly didn't go to university. And they just weren't into reading. And I, I don't know why, it wasn't anybody. It was just like you, I, I, I just like to read. And I picked up reading at a very early age. So I went to the public library and I'd bring back a wagon load of books and I would just read. My sister was never into reading. She was never into school and academics, whereas I just loved it. You know, I couldn't wait to go to school. I thought it was fun. But partly it's because you're good at, you, you're good at it and you like to do what you're good at. And my sister didn't like it and wasn't good at it. And, you know, and then that kind of snowballs, doesn't it? And, and so I, I think it is such an important way to think about the environment, not this passive model in which the environment's out there and it happens to us, but this active model of experience in which we select and modify and create environments that are correlated with our genetic propensities. So I, I think that is a very important direction for research. And we still really don't have a handle on it. Who's studying this sort of active approach to the environment? You know, I don't see we have measures of it. It's really hard to try and measure it. But I think that's where we ought to be going, looking at this interplay between genes and environment. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, so when in the first law of behavioral genetics, and I hope that I'm saying this correctly, you say that uh, behavioral traits uh, are all heritable, uh, what does that mean exactly? That um, the ways people behave uh, are, are the ones that are allowed for by our genetics or not exactly that? Well, the first part was right. I, I think as a, as a marker for how much things have changed. In the 70s when I was in graduate school, if you said anything in psychology had, was heritable, showed genetic influence, people get very upset. And now we can say, show me any trait that does not show significant genetic influence. That's how much things have changed. And so this is a way of just kind of challenging people on that to say everything that we've studied shows genetic influence. But the, the second part of what you were asking about is to sort of to define heritability. And it is very important to do that that, as I said before, we're not talking about that it's the same for all of us that makes us human, but the 1% that differs. But there's 3 billion base pairs of DNA, so that means there's millions of DNA differences between us. So that's the first point, that we're only talking about differences. And then the second is, we're only talking about differences as they exist in the populations we study at that time with that mix of genetic and environmental influence. It's merely descriptive. We're saying, um, we're describing how much 
of the variants can be ascribed to individual differences in inherited DNA versus the rest, which we call environment. And, and then thirdly, so the second point is we're, we're dealing with this normal range of variation that we study in our sample. So we're not studying extreme mutations. So traits that are heritable 20, 30%, there can still be a, a mutation that causes huge differences for an individual. But it's so rare. Most of those rare single gene mutations are one in hundreds of thousands of individuals. So if you have a sample of a few thousand individuals, you're not going to have that represented. Represented, And similarly, on the other side, and this is where people get um, upset about, um, is we're not studying environmental mutations. That is, we're not studying environments that aren't part of the normal range either. And so we're, by saying these family influences aren't important, you get people really upset because they're, you know, talking about a, abuse, severe abuse and neglect. And I'm saying we, we can only this, we can only study what we study. And, you know, these other events could be very important. Now, some people argue, but they're not rare. Well, then I would say if they're not rare and they're common, neglect and abuse, then we are studying them and they're not important, you know, so take your choice. But uh, it is important to emphasize, we're only describing what is, we're not predicting what could be. So sure, there could be other cultures where you get very different results. What's been surprising to me really is to see that these results are pretty similar around the world. You know, like the heritability, the cognitive abilities seems to be the case in rural India and uh, developed India and in some countries that have, are very poor and other countries that are wealthy. It doesn't have to be that way. I don't have any investment in it being that way. It's just those are the data so far. Um, but we can only describe particular populations. We can't, it doesn't predict what would be in other populations. And by the way, experiments are basically about what could be rather than what is. So if you go into lab and you do something and people respond a certain way, that means, yes, in those situations, you can make them do something, but it doesn't mean that's the cause of individual differences out there in the real world, which is another major mistake in psychology, because that's, again, a normative approach. We say, yeah, you assign people randomly to groups. Everybody's kind of the same. And you know what we call individual differences in experimental analysis in ANOVA? It's the error term, individual differences. Well, it's the error term that we're studying. We want to know why people are different in the real world. We don't want to say, on average, if you do this to people, you can change their behavior. You know, not to say that's a, a bad thing to do. I mean, you want to maybe know how you can change behavior. That's great. But you can't assume then that that what could be is the cause of what is. And we can't assume that the causes of what is tell us something about what could be. A trait could be completely heritable and you could change it absolutely environmentally. You know, an example that's often given is tooth decay. Individual differences in tooth decay um, shows a strong genetic component. But there are people say modern dentistry and preventive dentistry with flossing and you know, staining your teeth, you could eliminate plaque, the major cause of tooth decay immediately. So completely heritable, maybe highly heritable, and yet you can change it environmentally. So the, I'm glad you're bringing up these points because I think a lot of people, they haven't really thought it through much. What I find talking to people is everyone says, yeah, you know, DNA, DNA revolution, but you scratch the surface of what people know and they, d they really don't know very much. And so another reason I wanted to write the book is that I think the DNA revolution is happening in psychology. And it's time to launch a discussion about it, you know, and its implications for psychology and society. And to do that, though, people need a certain level of DNA literacy and genetic literacy. And you know, it sounds pompous to say that, but I think by a lot of people's comments, it's clear that they don't really understand how DNA works. And so I think it is important that we kind of up the game in terms of getting people to the level where they can really participate in these discussions. And I think it'll make them less hostile if they kind of know what's going on, rather than, um, I find, if you talk to people about it, about what they know about DNA, 
it often does have this sort of mystical homunculus flavor to it. Genes are something in your head that are making you do things. So it's so important to realize these are just dumb chemicals. So, um, so it's great to have opportunities like this to explain to people. I'm not actually too sure who your audience is. I assume they're scientifically literate, interested people particularly, but who, who is your audience? Well, well, I agree with, with you, at least um, with the people I've been interacting, uh, most of them are really already scientifically minded and are interested in topics, particularly from psychology and things like that. So I, I would say that that's right. <laughs> okay. Right. So, so uh, and I think that another thing that the environmentalists speak on to try to make an argument against behavioral genetics and innateness and even perhaps genetics in general um, is the fact that um, complex traits and in this case we can refer to behavioral traits uh, they are all polygenic and so I mean <laughs> there's that a small complication that perhaps from studies come, uh, done with, again, twins and adoptees, we know that a particular behavioral trait is, for example, 50% heritable, but then uh, at least until now through genome-wide association studies, uh, we have only identified, for example, a particular number of genes that account only for, I don't know, 10% of the variance, for example. So, I mean, and, and there, that's another thing that people usually refer to when they, when they try to dismiss uh, the effects of genetics and things like that. Right. Well, first, we should know there are two different issues. One is, to what extent are inherited DNA differences in total. And identical twin studies, I mean, studies of twins and study of adoptees all converge on the conclusion that about half of the differences between people are heritable. This other issue of identifying the DNA differences responsible for heritability is a different issue. And it's been, there's, the progress has actually been amazing. Now, I'll come back to only 10% and what that means, but the first genome-wide association studies that were done well, first of all, there were the candidate gene studies that never replicated. So that was kind of a downer for people doing that. Um, but when the genome-wide association studies were done, I don't know if you're, should I explain what that means? Uh, uh, yes, yeah. perhaps it's yeah. Yeah. Well, it was just, instead of a candidate gene approach where you say, well, certain neurotransmitters like um, serotonin are probably important in, in depression. Instead of identifying genes you think are important, which we could only do back then, because you can only study a few genes, you know, economically. It was very difficult to do. Then a new technology came along, these chips, DNA chips that have, uh, that are able to genotype on a, plat a platform as small as a postage stamp, hundreds of thousands of DNA differences. So that's when people decided we could look at DNA differences throughout the whole genome and the it's just the opposite of a candidate gene approach. These genome-wide association studies are atheoretical. They say, let's just look at DNA differences throughout all 23 pairs of chromosomes and ask if any of those make a difference. But to do that, you need huge studies. So the first study was done, the big one, in 2007, one of the most highly cited, cited studies in science. It was like cited tens of thousands of times. Um, they found differences, significant differences, correcting for a million tests. You know, in psychology, we know about multiple testing, but here we're talking about testing a million hypotheses at the same time. There are like a million different kind of more or less independent units in the genome of three billion base pairs. So even with that sort of massive correction. You're not talking about 0.05 significance. You're talking about 0.00000005 because you're correcting for all those multiple tests. They still found some significant differences. But what was amazing was that the biggest differences were incredibly small. They're accounting for like in continuous traits like height and weight, 0.02 
percent of the variance. That's 0. 0.0002 of the variance. Those are the biggest effects. So if those are the biggest effects, then the other effects must be smaller and much smaller. So that's when people realize that what you need are massive studies. I mean, psychologists know this. If you're trying to detect small effects, you need big studies to do it, to have the power to detect those effects. But this is like many magnitudes greater problem than any psychologist has imagined. To, to detect effects that account for much less than 0.02% of the variance. So that's been the big development in the last few years. So in my area, I'm interested in cognitive development and the um, business end of it in education, how kids do at school. And three years ago, with identified SNPs, these DNA differences called single nucleotide polymorphisms, we were able to identify 0% of the variance. Two years ago, uh, 3%. That last year, 10%. And this year, 16% of the differences between children. Now, you can say, but that's only, you said only 10%. Well, you know, this is only 16%. But the advance has been amazing to explain 16% of the variance, first of all. And it doesn't look like it's tapering off. It looks like by getting these massive studies, the last one was over a million people. Because then, only then do you begin to scoop up these small effects in any sort of reliable way. So we're, we haven't seen the end of it. I predict in the book that we're going to double our predictive power in the next few years. But still, say we get up to 25% or 30% of the variance explained by DNA alone. I should emphasize this is just DNA from any cell in your body because they all have the same DNA. So uh, even if we explain 30%, though, these tests of educational achievement are about 60% heritable. So we're only explaining half of the variance that's genetic. And there's lots of interest in this issue of missing heritability and what causes it. We could go into that. But the point I'd like to make is you've got to be careful about saying only 10% or only 30%, because I would challenge people. First of all, we're explaining more variance in educational achievement with DNA then we can explain based on the parents' educational achievement, you know, whether they went to university or not, for example. So um, in the behavioral sciences, most of the findings people talk about are explaining much less than 5% of the variance. What we're doing here is we're putting effect size up front, not statistical significance, which is, I think, you know, that's a big controversy in psychology, that maybe the reasons why there's this replication crisis is that we focused on p-values and significance and you know the stuff about chasing p-values and that sort of thing it's a real scandal i wrote a paper a few years ago a couple years ago saying what excites me about behavioral genetics is these results replicate you know over the decades and um, i think that's really important and part of the reason for that is to focus on effect size rather than statistical significance so did this effect size of six, say 15% of the variance of educational achievement. What else predicts variance like that? In England, we have these very expensive school inspections. Every school gets inspected, thousands of schools, every two, three, four years. And a, a team of inspectors, government inspectors, goes in for two days. They cost about 20,000 pounds, say, to do this. And how much these are good ratings of the schools. You know, it's not just how good the teachers teach, but it's the supportiveness of the environment and the atmosphere is there bullying, that sort of thing. So these are the probably the best you could do at trying to evaluate schools, the quality of a school. And it leads to these league tables. We rank schools as to how good they are. And then parents do a lot of weird things to get their kids into the best school. Well, how much of the variance in these educational achievement tests is explained by these expensive quality of school ratings. The answer is about 2%. So 2% versus 15% with DNA alone. I mean, you know, it's one of the most powerful predictors we have in the behavioral sciences. And we'll be able to predict more of the variants with these, but we're at the point now where these are some of our best predictors. And that's why this is where the DNA revolution is gonna hit psychology. Because in any study, 
if you just collect the DNA, which, you know, spit in the tube and you get this DNA and you can do the whole thing for 50 euros probably. And, you know, and then you think of fMRI or something like that would cost 500 euros a shot or something, you know, for an hour. It's really cheap to get DNA and to genotype it and to get these polygenic scores. And so what I'm encouraging psychologists to think about is just not becoming geneticists, just incorporate these things in your research and they'll help you understand whatever you're interested in studying at another level of analysis. You don't have to become a geneticist. You don't need special samples like twins or adoptees. Just whatever you're studying, whatever group you're studying, if you collect the DNA, it's going to be a much richer study. Mm -hmm. Yes, but I think that perhaps then is when people start talking about things like uh, equality of opportunity, because I guess that one of the first things that comes to people's mind is that, so if we can explain 15% of the variance in terms of uh, academic success, let's say, b uh, among children, perhaps if we were to know that a particular child had certain traits from its birth, for example, mm -hmm. then perhaps we would try to uh, direct her more towards certain special uh, school programs or something like that, and then uh, she would not be exposed to the best education possible and then she would probably be missing on, on uh, missing on that or something like that uh, i mean what what would you say about that well again you raise many different issues there i mean equality of opportunity is something i go into in the book and um we got i hope everybody realizes that equality of opportunity doesn't equal equality of outcome mm -hmm. you know if you could give kids somehow exactly the same environments, does anyone still think they're all going to come out the same? You know, teachers don't think that. They can see that some kids just learn a lot better than other kids. And so there's another aspect you want to make sure you emphasize. Um, people worry about fatalism, the idea that if you know your genetic risk for something, um, you'll say there's nothing you can do about it. Well, again, that's misunderstanding of genetics. We're talking about if you, it's true, if you had a single gene disorder like Huntington's disease, it will kill you unless something else kills you first. It doesn't matter what your environment is. It doesn't matter about anything. It's deterministic and hardwired. And the problem is that's the way most people learn about genetics from Mendel on. These are single gene mutations that are like hardwired. Whereas here we're talking about thousands of DNA differences, a very tiny effect. And that is a real shift in perspective because it means we're talking about probabilistic propensities. You know, it's not pre-programmed, deterministic, innate sort of, um, well, it's just not deterministic in that same way. And so that's a very important point. So you mentioned what if you know that your child is has a high score on, we call it EA3, Educational Attainment 3, is this G genome-wide association study polygenic score. What if you knew she had a high score or a low score? Well, before I get to that, let's look at some other polygenic scores that are around. Oh, but by the way, could I Can just ask paper? you to tell people what is a polygenic score? Because I'm yes, not good. sure that you've already yeah. done that. No, that's right. Um, when I started talking about the early genome-wide association studies a decade ago, I said they did make some genome-wide significant hits. You know, they, they found some SNPs that were statistically significant after correcting for a million multiple tests. But the effect sizes were very small, 0.02% of the variance. What can you do with that? You know, it, you can't use it to predict. How are you going to trace gene behavior pathways if it's such a tiny effect? Well. The answer in the last few years has been to say you can put all those tiny effects together in what we call a poly multiple genetic score. It's what psychologists do all the time with items on a test. If we're measuring shyness, you don't just ask one question, you ask a few questions because no one item is going to be that predictive. It's, it's only capturing one aspect of it maybe. So you put them together and you 
score them on a test. You, you have to reverse them so they go in the right direction, so they all add up to a high score for shyness, for example. So that's all we're doing here, but we're adding up thousands of DNA differences. And the test then is how much of the variance does it predict in an independent sample? And so what the revolution in the last couple of years has been to say, don't just take the top hits, keep adding hits until you no longer add to the prediction in an independent sample. And when you take that approach, you end up adding tens of thousands of SNPs. So each of them have very small effects on average in the population. It could be that you and I have 5,000, 10,000 different SNPs that are particularly affecting our trait. But the point is you can add them up, you know, based on their effect size in the population, these tens of thousands of SNPs, and create a polygenic score that can predict the trait in an independent sample. And so in our study, we're predicting 15, 16% of the variance in these national tests of school achievement that all kids in the UK have to take when they leave school at the age of 16, at the end of compulsory education. So that this polygenic score is very important that people get that because that's, that's where, as I say, the DNA revolution is going to hit psychology because you can incorporate those in psychological research and as I say in my book, they're going to make a huge difference in terms of clinical psychology as well. So you were asking about the negative aspects of this. And again, I'm a cheerleader. I see lots of good that can come from this. Any big discovery can, do, can be used for good or bad. We need to talk about these issues. But there's so many people talking about, um, I call them doomsayers, you know, all, all the negative things that could happen. So before we talk about educational achievement, think about, say, cardiovascular risk. There was a paper in Nature Genetics a couple months ago that shows that you can predict your chances of heart through DNA better than you can with just about anything else. And so we have polygenic scores that are very good predictors. And you can show in the UK, 8% of the people are walking around with a polygenic score above the clinical risk. That is a threefold greater risk than average. And so some people are saying, isn't it unethical that we are not telling people that they have this polygenic risk for heart attacks? Because you can prevent heart attacks in, in lots of ways, you know, just in terms of how you live, but also there are body scans and things that can be done that can tell you you're, you really need to start treating this person now. Don't wait till they have a heart attack. So the really cool thing about polygenic scores is they're going to allow us to move towards a preventive approach rather than waiting until people have problems and trying to fix them. Well, that's medical, but that's where it's going to happen. I think the National Health Service is going to make polygenic scores available for everyone. In Finland, they started a program where if you go to the hospital and they take blood, you're asked, do you want, to, do you want this information to be made available? Do you want to participate in this research, but also to provide to have the NHS provide that information, you know, if you are at risk for something. And people, everyone wants to do it, you know, and I think um, that's the way it's going to go. We'll do this medically, but then psychologically, all you got to do is it, do it once, and it's the same information, the same DNA chip can be used to give you right now, say, 250 polygenic scores. And that includes things like depression. They're not as good. Schizophrenia is one of the better ones. Reading, cognitive abilities. So I think this is going to happen. And um, if you think of problems, like no one minds if you say you're going to do something with genetics and reading disability. But if you talk about reading ability, people get more upset along the lines that you were saying. But what about some psychological things like alcoholism? If you knew you were at, say, a five-fold greater risk of being alcoholic based on your DNA, I think that would be important for a prevention because you cannot become alcoholic unless you drink a lot of alcohol. So if you knew that you or your child even were, was at high risk for alcohol, you can tell your child, look, there might be this problem. It doesn't mean you're going to be alcoholic, but you're taking a risk. If you go out and drink as much as an adolescent with your friends, as they do, they're not at risk genetically for being alcoholic, but you are. Now, it doesn't, you know, it's not, it's probabilistic. You want to emphasize that. 
but would you want to take that risk? You know, because alcoholism is, we talk about drugs and alcohol, dr alcohol is the worst drug around in terms of the damage it does to people and society. So that uh, prevention, I think, is an important way of approaching this. So then you get to the hard one. What about educational achievement? And what if you knew that your kid had a low polygenic score for educational achievement? Well, this is the toughest case because we value that so much, especially university educated parents, you know, have a lot of trouble, you know, if their kid doesn't want to go to university. Well, you think of me and my sister, we, we're both, when we went to school, I loved it. I did really well at it. So I did it more and I loved it. And, um, you know, she didn't. Well, suppose she had a low EA3 polygenic score. And do we want to force everybody to be on that same academic standard. And I think people in Europe are better than in the UK and the US. Those are the only two cultures I know. But I hear in Germany and Switzerland, I don't know about Portugal, that a lot of parents, middle-class parents, they wouldn't push their kids in an academic track. It's a, 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 a um, I don't know if you call it an apprenticeship track, but something where you learn some occupation, like you know programming, engineering, you know, I, I think it's a much more secure uh, post for a, a child, you know, that they could get a job that will pay them a decent salary, that sort of thing. Um, and so I think it is important then to even recognize that this academic sort of uh, intelligence that we value so much, there are big differences there. And are we only going to evaluate people on that one standard, you know, and make them do things that like my sister that she didn't really like to do she's not she knows she's not very good at it you know why does she have to keep beating her head against the wall and feeling like a failure she ended up being a very good lab technician you know she just loves doing robot like repetitive things very accurately very fast you know and, you know who's and she's happy as a clam i mean and she makes a good salary and she's probably much more secure in her future than a lot of, uh, you think of poor PhD students these days and the uncertainty of their future. And, and, and really, fundamentally, do we need more professors or do we need more plumbers and engineers and programmers and, you know, people who are, it's said that half of the kids growing up now are going to be doing jobs that we don't even know exist now. So we need to be more flexible in our approach and not judge everyone against one standard. But it is hard when you get, you know, if you, uh, people who adopt children, uh, a lot of my friends, you know, they spend all their life not getting pregnant. And then finally, they're at a point where they want to get pregnant and they can. So many of them adopt children. And I'm amazed at how many of them don't even think about genetics. They really do believe at some deeper level uh, that all it takes is tender, loving care and you know, give the kids lots of books to read and, and everyone's going to go to university and be brilliant. But, you know, if they're lucky, they get a kid of average intelligence. But the average IQ of people with PhDs is 130. The difference between 130 and 100 is the difference between 100 and 70, which is borderline mental, you know, intellectual disability. So the relative difference there is really great. And I find it, a lot of these parents have great difficulty with that because they, they value this university education and academic training so much and it, and it creates real conflict. But what is going to be important about the DNA revolution is people begin to see how different kids in the same family are because, you know, you're 50% similar to your siblings, but that means you're 50% different genetically. So if you take two kids in the population at random, their average difference in IQ is about um, 17 IQ points, I think it is. Oh, no, 13, isn't it? And you take two kids in a family, you know, families with siblings, and you look at their average difference, and it's like 10. There's a big range of genetic differences within a family. And the really nice thing about DNA is it tells you about individual risk and prediction. It's not like your father's alcoholic, all the kids in a family have a five-fold greater risk of alcoholism. It could say that you have a much greater risk of alcoholism. DNA could. But your sibling doesn't have a risk. So I think 
the idea of using DNA to study differences within a family is going to be an important way to go here. But I get off the topic, really, um, uh, of how do you deal with, uh, say, self-fulfilling prophecies is partly what you were after, and labeling kids and all of that. These are issues we need to address, but um, I, I think um, the possibilities for using DNA to personalize ed education will be an important way to go. Right now, we just have these very general genetic predictors of educational achievement and intelligence. But I think we will, I'm very keen to get specific predictors for like STEM, you know, um, subjects like, you know, science, technology, and uh, engineering and math, independent of intelligence even. Because although a lot of genetic influences are general across many abilities, there's still a lot of specific genetic influence. And I think it would be incredibly useful to be able to get at those specific abilities as well. And, just, and also on the disability side. I mean, if you knew that your child would, if the genetic, you, you can now predict about, say, 8% of the variance in reading ability in children with DNA. It's, but, um, but if you knew your kid had uh, a high risk of reading disability, instead of waiting until they get to school and then fail at reading, which is what we do now, you could actually predict early that they might have problems with reading. Yet we know most reading kids with reading problems at school had language problems earlier. And you can't intervene with reading early because at three they're not reading, but they're certainly using language. So if you could intervene with language early, you might be able to prevent reading problems. Now you might say, well, why not do that for everybody? But the answer is that effective interventions are intensive, long-term, and expensive. Um, these magic bo silver bullets, you know, these cheap little tricks, gimmicks that will change reading problems, you know, they never work. So if it's going to be intensive and long-term, it's going to be expensive, and that probably means you have to try to predict which kids are most likely to have those problems, and then really go for it, you know, do whatever you can to help prevent these problems from occurring. So even in the educational realm, I can see a lot of positive uh, advantages to the, the DNA. But as I say, I'm a real cheerleader for this stuff. I acknowledge that there are these problems and issues that we need to discuss. And again, that's why I wanted to write this book, to get people talking about these topics. Mm -hmm. Yes, and you've raised some very interesting points there, because uh, I think that from a certain point on, we're no longer, re we're no longer really talking about uh, science, and we're moving on to perhaps ethics and social values and social norms. Because, for example, when you refer to the case of you and your sister, uh, one thing that immediately came to my mind is that perhaps uh, in, in the so-called weird societies, that is the Western, educated, industrialized, rich, rich and, and democratic, that we put too much, too much value into being intelligent by itself. And, and for example, perhaps there are many people, as you say, that would be perfectly happy with having a trade job, for example. And here in Portugal, sometimes it's very sad because people really devalue people who, who have those kinds of occupations and perhaps only value people who go to university and are doctors and lawyers and politicians and dentists and university professors and other things like that. And, and I mean, there, there are also a lot of other aspects to consider because, for example, someone might be high in IQ but, for example, low in conscientiousness, and uh, and then <laughs> that person mi might m might not mm. be that good, uh, really in in also pursuing uh, 
uh, higher education, let's say, because it's not only a matter of being of being very intelligent. It's also a matter of of putting the work on and uh, other stuff like that, and and really following a schedule and and things like that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I agree completely with everything you say, and as you say, this is getting out of the realm of science and into areas that I'm not an expert in. But in this book, I thought I had to address some of the implications, like in terms of equal opportunity, as you said, and meritocracy. Because in a way, the genetics suggests kind of paradoxical, uh, has some paradoxical implications for some of these topics. So I go into that in the book. I don't know if we want to go into those here. But the, the first point I make, though, is that there are no necessary policy implications of finding genetic influence. That has to do with your values. You could have right-wing values, and you might actually, stupidly probably, say, if, from a right-wing point of view, why not educate the best and forget the rest? And then society can have these people who make all these great discoveries. I think that would be very short-sighted, because the intellectual capital of a society is not just based on the few people who invent social media and things like that. It requires a whole infrastructure of people who can make things happen as a result of that. So the other perspective, though, like a Finnish model of education is to say, um, let's recognize some kids are going to have a lot of trouble learning. And what will our values say, let's put as much resource into the opposite end of the continuum, not the best, but the ones who have the most trouble and do whatever it takes to bring them up to minimal levels of literacy and numeracy because you no longer can participate in society unless you have those basic uh, literacy skills. So it's a matter of your values, I think, and you hope that you can make better decisions with knowledge than without, uh, but that may be a little Pollyannish these days. But uh, yeah, I'm, not, I'm not that convinced that... Um, policymakers care that much about data, really. I mean, you know, they can make their decisions and if some data come along that kind of fit what they're saying, fine. But if, if the data doesn't confirm what they're saying, they're not too troubled by it because they, they just want to make this difference. So um, it's, it's an important issue, though, the, these policy-related issues. But I do want to emphasize that my um, thoughts about it are no better than anybody else's because, you know, it's not my area of expertise. But I thought in the book I had to address some of these issues. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So now let's talk a little bit about the ways by which uh, clinical psychology and psychiatry classify mental conditions, because you also talk a little bit about that in your book and you refer to the fact that perhaps we should change the way we do it. For example, instead of using a qualitative system of, quanti uh, of classification, uh, perhaps moving on to a quantitative system, because it seems that uh, these mental uh, pathologies or diseases or conditions, whatever you want to call them, they occur in a continuum, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I do think it's a very important aspect of the DNA revolution. So there's first the issue of genetic influence, and I think clinical psychology had trouble with genetics in the 70s and 80s because they thought, well, if these are genetic, genetically influenced, it puts us out of business it means you can't do anything about it. Well, I hope in my book I make it clear that just because something's genetically influenced does not mean you can't do anything about it. And because causes and cures aren't necessarily related, but it's, it's important to know. If you think schizophrenia is caused by what your parents do to you in the first few years of life, it's just wrong. And if you have therapies like a lot of the psychoanalytic therapies that are based on going back to how your parents treated you in the first three years of life, that's wrong. It's not going to go anywhere. So it is important to understand that genetics is important, but it's also important to say that doesn't mean you can't do something about it. You know, the best example, unfortunately, there aren't many of these examples, but the best one, you know, is phenylketonuria, PKU, which caused in the, in the 40s and 50s about 1% of the severely mental uh, retarded, institutionalized patients. 
and that's a single gene cause. It's recessive, but it's you know totally genetic. And yet, um, the reason why we screen all newborns around the world for this with that little heel prick that they do when a baby's first born to get a little bit of blood is to test for this genetic disorder and now many other genetic disorders. But the reason it's done is from because from a cost-benefit of point of view, you can't afford not to do it because this genetic disease can be um, treated as too strong. But you can avoid the problems of, uh, you know, this gene causes um, a, a breakdown in metabolism of phenylalanine. You can't metabolize phenylalanine, which is one of those amino acids you get you don't produce yourself, you get from the outside, like in, especially in early breast milk called colostrum, and then also in uh, dairy products and red meat. Well, if you can't break down phenylalanine, which you need, but if you can't break it down, it builds up in the developing brain and somehow, we still don't know how, causes this massive mental retardation. So people putting this together said, what if we give kids a diet low in phenylalanine? And that pretty much takes care of the problem. So there is a completely genetic disorder that's completely um, cured is too strong. They still have the genetic problem, but it, it's sidestepped the uh, bullet in a way. And these people end up with pretty normal IQs. It's, there's still problems that come about. But it's a great example, though, of how the causes of something aren't necessarily related to the cures. And I'm sure that's true in clinical psychology as well. So those are all basic, important genetic issues. But the very specific one that most people haven't quite caught on to yet is that polygenic scores involve thousands of DNA differences. So, you know, the central limit theorem, which is the basis of all probability and statistics, says that, uh, you know, it, like if you flip, a, it, it, it basically says you will get a normal distribution if you've got a lot of things that affect something. So if you've got, you know, if you flip a coin, say you flip 10 coins 100 uh, time and time again and count the number of heads, you know, it'll, you, mostly the average will be five and you'll get a distribution around that, but it'll be a perfectly normal distribution if you keep doing this experiment, flip the coin uh, 10 times, uh, you know, do it 100 times or whatever, you get this normal distribution. Well, that's what we're doing with genes too. We're flipping alleles. They can either be one or the other, and so it's a bit like that, and you get a perfectly normal distribution so that the, the polygenic score for schizophrenia, autism, reading disability, achievement, these are all perfectly normal. There's no point at which there's any break. And so that means for, we all have thousands of DNA differences that push us a little bit towards schizophrenia. It's all quantitative, though. It's a question of how many. It's more or less. And the idea that we should find this cut point, threshold, that once you cross that, you're schizophrenic, and until you cross that, you're not schizophrenic. I mean, no clinician believes that's true for any psychological disorder, right? That it, you know, alcoholism, obesity, none of these common problems are like that. There, there are genetic problems like that, single gene disorders. They are necessary and sufficient. They're either or. You know, as I said, you have the gene for Huntington's, it's dominant, it will kill you. So that's dichotomous, qualitative. But in psychology, we're only dealing with these common quantitative disorders. So that's why the chapter is called um, The Abnormal is Normal, in the sense that there isn't uh, illness or not. And it really comes from the medical model, which says that we ought to start by this diagnosis, you know, do you have cholera or not? And then to say, what is the cause of cholera? And that works for a lot of medical diseases. And it works for single gene disorders. But it doesn't work when we're dealing with common, quantitatively distributed traits. So I, there's a lots of reasons not to like diagnoses, including, you know, it's like us versus them. You know, there are those poor schizophrenics, and then there are those, us normal people. And it's not. We're all schizophrenic to some extent. It's just a, a quantitative issue. And then the implications that follow are, are pretty amazing. If there are no disorders, that's what I'm saying. There are no disorders. There are only dimensions. 
if there are no disorders, there's no disorder to cure. All we can do is alleviate symptoms. It's quantitative. It's not, are you cured or not? It's a question of how much you can ameliorate the symptoms, how much you can prevent the problems from developing from this continuum. So there's, there's two or three other uh, examples of the ways in which polygenic scores will transform clinical psychology. But um, the one, the, uh, another one I mentioned before is prevention. Because with DNA, you can predict your height, your weight, your, schi your schizophrenic, schizophrenic risk from birth just as well as you can now as an adult. And that means it's the perfect early warning system for preventing problems rather than waiting until problems occur. And there is increasing evidence that even with schizophrenia, certainly with alcoholism and other, some other problems, depression, if you can prevent these problems, you know, if you knew your child's at risk for depression, say, for example, CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, is probably good for all of us. It's basically healthy thinking. You know, don't ruminate about all the bad stuff that have happened to you. You know, think about some of the positive things. Think about how you can change the things that are wrong. You know, it's just common sense in a way, isn't it? You know, like healthy thinking. It's probably good for all of us, but it might be especially good for people who have a propensity towards depression, you know, to stop themselves when they're getting into that rumination about, oh God, that was so terrible and I'm such a bad person and all of that. So I, I, I do think this prevention will probably be the way in which we uh, polygenic scores will really make a difference in clinical psychology. Um, but one other example is the idea that um, will move away from the idea of one size fits all in terms of treatment to thinking about personalizing it. Like, as soon as we get a polygenic score, say for ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, so, you know, in, in America especially, but increasingly in England, not so much in the rest of Europe, I think, if a kid is diagnosed as a they're likely to get an amphetamine as a drug treatment methylphenidate, Ritalin, and you know, there are reasons why that probably helps kids. I mean, those of us from the 60s and 70s know that speed amphetamine helps you concentrate. So that's probably true, too, for ADHD kids. But, you know, if, if you could get a polygenic score that would predict which kids would profit from it and which kids won't, or this will really make a difference, if you could find a polygenic score that would predict which kids are damaged by it, you know, because it's not a not a, a nice thing to be giving amphetamines to young kids, you know, for lots of reasons. So if you didn't have to, that would be great. But if you shouldn't, that is, it could really have a negative effect on kids. Parents would demand this. And I think where it's really going to happen first is, again, in the medical area. Because right now, you can get a polygenic score to predict whether you'll have Alzheimer's when you get older. And that's there's one gene, apolipoprotein E, that has a big effect on it. But with these direct-to-consumer genotyping services, right now you can find out if you have this gene, this allele called ApoE4, that greatly increases your risk for Alzheimer's. So at 85 years of age, 80 years of age, we all have like a 10% risk of being Alzheimer's, having Alzheimer's, which is very high. But if you have um, it, two form uh, alleles for this recessive um, trait, if you have for this gene, if you have two of those alleles, your risk goes from 10% to 80%. So that is, as these things go, that's a very big uh, risk factor. So right now, people almost, a lot of people don't want to know. I find among my colleagues, you can do the direct to consumer testing and you have to tick a box yes, I want to know my Alzheimer's risk score. You don't get it then. You still have to then later say, yes, I really want to get it. And then, yes, I understand what, you know, I'm asking about here. Because, you know, it's a big deal if you found out you have an 80% risk of having Alzheimer's disease when you get older. I find you ask university colleagues about it, and they kind of split down the middle. Half of the people say, no way do I want to know. It would ruin my life. But the other half, which I'm in, I say, of course I want to know. 
I mean, I want to, I, there are things you can do, even though you can't cure it. There are things you can do, right? You could predict, I mean, you could plan for it, for example. You know, you could plan socially, but also financially, you know, you're going to need care later in life. And also it might make you, you know, carpe diem, the idea, you know, you might decide, well, I better really enjoy my life now because later in life I have this significant risk of having Alzheimer's, which, you know, it, it, at least you could say, well, you got to you got to live a long time before you get the Alzheimer's. But what if now with this polygenic score, the problem right now is you can't do anything about it. I mean, the one thing you can do is avoid boxing and head injuries. That's the only known environmental cause or I mean, it's a small effect, but it's it does have an effect. But what if someone came along with a drug that, like most of these drugs, they don't fix the problem once it occurs. But if you could take a drug early in life that could prevent or at least ameliorate or stall the onset of Alzheimer's, everybody would want to get this polygenic score. So I think that's where it's going to happen. And then it will eventually spill over into psychology. Because really, is Alzheimer's a medical disease? It's actually psychological. Have you ever noticed anything that becomes useful like Alzheimer's or important suddenly is no longer dementia, which is purely psychological, right? I mean, all we know is memory loss and you know problems like that. These are psychological problems, but this is a medical disease. Yeah, okay, the brain is messed up, but the brain's involved in everything in psychology. That doesn't make it a, a neurological disorder. So it is psychological, but I think more and more this polygenic score revolution is going to flow over from the medical area into psychology because once you get your DNA, it, you can use that to get any polygenic score, including psychological polygenic scores. So another reason. So these are all ways in which um, the DNA revolution and polygenic scores are already beginning to transform clinical psychology. Um, I'm glad to have a chance to talk about that, Ricardo, though, because I do get a, a few clinicians who write and say, well, what good is any of this? And, you know, finding DNA, because I get it from teachers, too. You know, you get this kid who's hyperactive and having reading problems. I mean, what good is this stuff for that teacher in that classroom? And, you know, fair enough in some ways. I, I do think it's important for a teacher or a clinician to say, um, well, we don't just blame the person or the parents. We realize people are different genetically, and that kind of changes your perspective a bit. You know, you're not thinking this kid is just a terrible kid or the parents are terrible parents. You know, you realize kids are just different genetically. But it, it's fair enough to say, I, I, you know, for the teacher or the clinician confronted with this very disruptive, aggressive kid who's having all sorts of problems at school, I don't know how much this is going to help genetically. But certainly from a larger perspective and the idea of prevention, I think it could help. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, and now that we're talking about clinical psychology, could it be possible that perhaps uh, two problems that it has, and from uh, from uh, and perhaps the other things, the other problems stem from these, is that on the one hand, uh, p perhaps they rely too much still on patients' reports, that is, they ask people to tell them, uh, to tell them about p basically uh, the main events yeah. in their lives and things like that, and I mean, they haven't yet incorporated properly these genetic tools into their practice, and of course, if they ask people to talk about their lives, th that's all that people can do, and people can't really tell them about their genetics. And yeah. uh, on the other hand, uh, p perhaps it would it could be possible that uh, clinical psychologists also have somewhat of a biased sample of people from the the overall population because I mean mm -hmm. perhaps th there tends to be certain people with certain personality traits or certain other psychological traits that uh, tend to seek help 
from clinical psychologists or psychiatrists, and then also a thing that really comes about in the behavioral genetics literature that is related to the fact that uh, if people uh, grow up or develop in deprived environments, then uh, those de uh, then the environmental effects have uh, influence much more their development than uh, than happens with people that uh, are not really deprived of anything when they're developing and then perhaps that's when we obtain a larger genetic effect. So, I, I mean, do any of these, does any of these make sense or? Well, absolutely. You, again, you raised several different questions there. I don't know if I can keep track of all of them, but the first one was about um, uh, clinicians only working with symptoms. So the only way you know about depression is the person tells you they're depressed. And what's interesting about polygenic scores is this is not a symptom, it's a cause, it's a predictive cause. And that's a different ball game for clinicians. Yeah, it doesn't explain everything. You can get people with high polygenic scores for depression who aren't depressed. But wouldn't it be good to know if the person you're seeing has a high genetic score for depression or not? I mean, that that ought to tell you something. You'd think the person without a high polygenic score might have more environmental causes of it. I mean, causes and cures aren't related. Just because it's genetic doesn't mean you have to give them drugs for depression. It's just, surely that's got to be useful information, um, this, the polygenic score down the line. So I don't think clinicians should think about genetics as being somehow in opposition to what they do. It's got to add to their uh, ability to detect problems and and also again to think about prevention rather than being a clinician waiting for people to get depressed and suicidal what wouldn't it be so much better if we try to get out in front of the uh, wave and prevent problems from occurring and there's a lot of interest in doing that you know in, in clinical psychology I and mean, especially here in England it's actually a very big program to try and um, pro you know identify people who are at risk for depression and do something about it before they're depressed. So uh, that was just the first question you asked. And, you know, again, I don't disagree with anything you said about the rest of that question, but perhaps you can, if there's a, a specific question you wanted to ask me in that uh, last bit of what you were talking about, uh, yes, perhaps about the behavioral genetics part, uh, the one about uh, people who grow up in deprived environments, perhaps uh, having uh, th their behavior having uh, a bigger environmental effects there. Perhaps, I mean, they, they could be deprived of, of food, of water, of hygiene, of health care. I mean, ma many yeah. very different things, but... Uh, p perhaps those are the cases that are the most extreme ones in terms of developing a full-fledged mental condition as the ones that we find in textbooks or... Something. Yeah, well again, we're only studying the populations we study and so if you uh, talked about um, a, a society in which people are, are really at the limits of um, environmental, you know, if you get kids who, like the orphanage sorts of studies that are done, you you can have, it's you could have a big effect. And so we're only studying this normal range of variation and we're saying these systematic environmental influences don't seem to be so important. But it's, it's kind of hard to believe, isn't it, that severe neglect wouldn't leave marks on kids. But even there, like in these Romanian orphanage studies that my colleague Mike Rudder works on, you know, where they came from Romania, and these were the worst sorts of institutions you could imagine. These, But the amazing thing is so many of those kids end up being perfectly fine. Now, how do you explain that? You know, is it a resilience? Is it a genetic resilience? So on average, that would have a pretty bad effect, as you could imagine. But there are still big individual differences. And fortunately, not many, I've never seen environments 
one-tenth as bad as those orphanage environments. So in the range of studies that we, samples we look at, it's probably not a significant contributor to environmental influence. But again, we're only describing what is, we're not saying what could be, and surely we could devise ways of screwing kids up, you know, like people often say, well, but if you put a, lock them in a closet, you know, that sort of thing. Well, that's, that's what could be. And, you know, we don't, we can't really speak to that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So perhaps just one last question. Um, according to the current state of the art in terms of identifying the genes through genome line association studies that are uh, associated with certain particular psychological traits, uh, would you say that perhaps uh, uh, w from what we know by now, it would justify in the near future using uh, uh, gene editing technologies to go to the specific genes and uh, trying to altering them to prevent certain certain conditions like I, I don't know for example uh, Alzheimer's or the risk of developing depression and things like that and I'm I'm not asking you about the ethics nor about if the yeah. if the gene editing technology works or not but from what we know in terms of the percentage of the variation that is explained by the genes that we've already identified uh, with the several different psychological traits and conditions what would you say about that well um, CRISPR you know these gene editing techniques that have just come up in the last few years are amazing in their potential for editing specific bits of DNA what we're already seeing though is that it's it's a bit more complicated sometimes there are unintended consequences um but it's still an amazing technique but how is it ever going to work if what you're talking about are thousands of dna differences and you could see where you could change an embryo where you know it's a few cells or with sperm and egg where there's just one cell basically in the initial zygote you could see doing gene editing there for a single gene disorder. But how are you going to do it if there's tens of thousands of genes? And the other thing is, unless you're doing it with that first cell or the first few cells, how are you going to change the trillions of cells in our body? You, know, you can't, I don't see how you can do that unless it's a very specific sort of thing like an eye problem or something, you know? So um, I don't really see that gene editing is going to have much of an impact on psychological traits other than single gene disorders and even there I think it's going to have to be at a prenatal stage you know so uh, for some medical disorders it, it's likely to be quite useful to correct genetic changes but uh, uh, problems but on the other hand there's a lot of concern about changing the human genome because if you do anything, then that would be an inherited DNA difference. For the best of intentions, it's a very complex, highly interconnected system, and un the risk of unintended consequences are severe. As we've seen just recently, people have raised all these issues in relation to the supposed babies who in China who were um, gene edited at uh, conception. So. Never say never, but um, I don't really see how it's going to have an impact on psychological traits um, in, in, the, in my foreseeable future, and maybe even in yours. <laughs> Yes, and I mean, we've been focusing a lot on the fact that complex traits are polygenic, but I think that there's also the complication here of uh, many genes having pleiotropic effects, that is, yes. that, that, that they uh, interact with several other products and give rise to different traits, being them psychological or strictly physical. So, I mean, if we were, for example, to identify seven genes uh, that, that if we were to alter them, it would improve our IQ in 
I don't know, one or two points, but if at the same time we were to know that it would raise the probability of developing a uh, neurological disease, for perhaps. example, in 40%, perhaps uh, it wouldn't be worth the risk, right? Yeah, that's what I um, unintended consequences. But I'm glad you raised this point about uh, pleiotropy. You know, the, the two big principles in genetics, one is pleiotropy. Every gene does lots of different things. You know, sometimes we call this a gene insulin receptor. Well, all these genes do many different things. So that's pleiotropy. But the converse of that is the other rule called polygenicity, polygenic. That is, any trait is influenced by many genes. So if each gene, each DNA difference affects a lot of traits, then each trait is going to be influenced by a lot of these DNA differences. And those two things make it very difficult to see how you're going to trace pathways from genes to brain to behavior. People will try to do that, and that's great. But um, I think it's, it's the reason why changing the DNA of any bit of the genome, the probability of unintended consequences for somebody is pretty severe, I would think, because there are no simple gene-brain behavior relationships. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so Dr. Plomin, just before we go, uh, apart from your books and the other things I've already referred to in the introduction, would you like to tell people what are some of the best places on the internet if they want to have, uh, to get in touch with more of your work? Well, I think uh, it would be interesting for people to read the dozens of reviews I've had and interviews. So if you just Google Robert Plowman and then you do the news thing, you know, you can click on news, then that's a really good place to start because, you know, a lot of those reviews are very thoughtful, very uh, extensive. Some are like five page sorts of reviews in the Times and that sort of thing. So I think that would be a great way of um, getting uh, more familiarity with this area. And then that would lead to more in-depth study if people wanted to do that. I should also say that in the back of my book, there are 60 pages of notes that give that document all the things I talk about and, and refer people with web links. All of the articles, everything have, have web links. So um, it, uh, it would be uh, people can learn as much as they want to learn about it. And then also for real serious students, there's the textbook that you mentioned, Behavioral Genetics. So that's another way to go. But it's really an up and coming area, up and coming area. And what excites me is that it's not just behavioral genetics now in psychologists. These are some of the hottest stuff is being done in behavioral economics. And, you know, I think eventually I hope in education as well. But sociology, I mean, a, a lot of areas are finally getting the genetic message. And in part, I think that's because of DNA. You can just ask questions you could never ask before. So I think it's we're just starting to see the effect of the DNA revolution in all the behavioral sciences, actually in all the life sciences. The problems we're addressing, missing heritability, finding genes for complex traits, these aren't psychological problems. These aren't even behavioral issues specifically. All the life sciences, medical sciences, biological sciences, these are the same issues that we're all addressing. So some of the brightest minds in science are tackling these issues, and that makes me even more optimistic that uh, the pace of discovery in this area is going to increase. And also, I think, I sort of wanted to get this point in, looking back on this five years from now, certainly 10 years from now, we're going to realize how little we knew, you know, and... I find that tremendously exciting. You know, a lot of areas of psychology are boring. It just seems like it's the same old stuff. You don't solve problems. You get bored with them. And then you go running off in some other direction with some other fad. And what I love about the genetics in psychology and everywhere is that it's progressive. You know, we're building information. And we, you know, make mistakes. You got to go back and reconstruct stuff. But it is very progressive. And technological changes um, have just dramatically upped the rate of progression in this area. So 
I wish I could be a student now, you know, and just starting the career because this is, uh, it's just going to be amazing, I think, in the next 10, 20 years. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. So, Dr. Plomin, I would really like to thank you for taking the time to be here with us today. Uh, and I mean, it was really a pleasure and an honor to be able to talk to you. I've been a really big fan of your work. So, well, thank you, Ricardo. It's really great talking to you too. I I've done a lot of interviews, probably about fifty or so, in the last few months, and um, uh, it makes such a difference to talk to someone who who knows the area a bit. You know, I just had an interview the other day where someone just said. Well, I understand you have this book that's come out. Can you tell me what it's about? <laughs> go, oh, no. Because I realize I can't do short interviews. That's why I appreciate an interview like this. It's just too complicated to try and get across in one of these television interviews, which if you get five minutes is considered incredibly long. And so I'm just not doing those anymore because you can't do justice to the complexity of these topics in short little sound bites. So that's why I really appreciate an interview like this and an interviewer like you who knows their stuff. So thank you very much, Ricardo. Okay, thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you a lot for watching this interview until the end and also, by the way, for coming to my channel. Uh, as you might have noticed, I've started this channel in February 2018 and have been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. To keep this channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge. Any amount, even if just one dollar, would already be a great help. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perel Galarsen, Lau Guerrero, Chantel Gelina, Jim Frank, Francis Ford and Hans Frederick Sunda. Thank you for all.